All right, everybody, welcome um, to the LFX Mentorship Showcase. In, in this showcase, we our 2022 graduates will be sharing their experiences. Uh, let's get started. Okay. All right, my name is Shwa Khan. I'm a Kernel Maintainer in Linux Palo at the Linux Foundation. I lead the mentorship programs. Um, let's start a little bit about, I'm going to show you resources today to, to learn. So let's start with the beginner's problem. Where do we start? We all struggle with where do we, when, when we want to learn something new, when we want to change a career direction, or when we are trying to figure out which open source um, project we want to um, get involved in. All of these things, we have to start somewhere. Um, where do we start is a problem for any journey to begin. Um, first of all, the first problem is to figure out what we're passionate about. Are we, um, what I'm, and what do I enjoy doing um, in the long term or even in the short term, five years? What do I want to do in the next five years? And which open source project to choose from? We have several to choose from, and it is always hard to determine Am I going to like doing kernel programming or, or am I going to be a better at doing AI? What do I enjoy the most? Or CNCF or Hyperledger and so on. So then the next question is we understand, we, did, we do our research, we understand what we want to do. And then we um, start uh, figuring out how do I get started? That, that is the second problem. And whenever we look at the code bases, they look always um, complex. And co communities look intimidating. Who do we look? Who, who do we reach out to? And uh, how do we? What's the best place to start? Those are the kinds of questions that uh, we all struggle with. Um, then comes the where. So once we figured out, okay, so I have a project, and I want to. I know kind of where I want to get started, and then where do I find resources? And once we figure out some resources, and then we go, who do? Who can we? Who can help us and who can we reach out uh, without being um, turned away or without being uh, appearing rude and so on. So, so now we have the what and how and where and who, right? So what's the next thing? So we understand that the G's journeys are hard. Um, and that is one of the reasons why we provide a lot of resources at the LF uh, for new developers to get started and figure out where they want to contribute to and how, and we show the learning paths. And you can go to uh, plan your learning paths. At, at, um, LF Training provides a learning uh, paths uh, pathways. So you can explore those pathways and figure out where you want to be. And then you can learn a lot of uh, um, topics, the technical topics, and learn, get a, get a background information, and then also, um, also um, information from experts in uh, interactive webinars. And we have several webinars um, uploaded. Um, you can go check them out. Um, they span multiple uh, topics uh, in various technical topics, um, deep dive into and talking with uh, experts, learning from ex experts, and then these are interactive sessions. And then you can start learning, um, applying for mentorship programs. And then once you complete the mentorship program, you can participate in the mentorship showcase like our graduates are doing today. And I'm going to leave you with this uh, pack to slides with a lot of information um, on uh, all the resources that we have at LF to, to help you with your journeys. And we um, just released a mentorship and open source uh, report that just came up um, yesterday. And you can take a look at it on, on our site. Uh, you can follow this link and download it and learn more about it. We wanted to, we are striving to continuously improve uh, our mentorship programs and learning resources, taking feedback from our graduates. Uh, pre, um, that is what we have done in this research. We went and asked our graduates uh, from since the beginning, 2019 through 2021, and asked them uh, what do they want to see more of? What kind of resources do they want? How do they want the mentorship program to look? 
So take a look, uh, read that, and um, and and then you can see where we are going. Or next, you'll understand our next steps as well. Okay, with that, um, I'm going to hand it off to Sanskar Bhushan um, to get started with uh, his presentation, and we'll be following in this order uh, for the uh, for this sure. rest of the mentorship. Thanks a lot. So I would like to talk about my mentorship experience while working on collaborative cloud native environments. And I would be discussing what they are and how they work. <clears throat> so I'm Sanskar Bhushan, and I would love to connect with your, this is my Twitter. So Here's an African proverb that I learned from my mentor that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And that's really powerful. That shows the power of collaboration and what collaboration can provide us with the, what type of values collaboration can provide us with. So what, what, what before discussing the problem, we should learn a bit about different ways to collaborate that exist right now. And what is collaboration? In on a piece of code, by by collaboration we essentially mean live collaboration. It's not like GitHub-based collaboration. It means live collaboration where someone can teach you what you are doing while coding along with you. That's really handy, uh, especially for those beginner. As you have said that that for those who are new to the journey, they do not know what to do. Building stuff and compiling stuff is really difficult for them. So for those type of beginner, this can be a really painful step. There are few uh, there are few tools that are available right now. For example, GitHub Code Spaces probably would be the most famous of them, it, though it is proprietary and it is of no use in a in an open source community because it's proprietary. There are few alternatives that have open source counterparts such as Gitpod and Coder provide uh, open source alternatives. I would be discussing about them very soon. Pair is an in-house open source software that is built in II. That is that is where my mentor belongs from. And uh, we would be discussing a bit about Pair as well. Uh, so now, what is Pair and what is Coder? So Pair is a used method for humans at II Co-op to collaborate with the only limitation of having GNU Emacs as its only IDE. And, uh, for those of you who have used GNU Emacs, they know the pain of, you know, using MX plus a lot of times different sort of, uh, you know, uh, keys, binding keys. So that's quite painful. And Coder is more of an infrastructure management tool that comes up with Code Server um, that is a, or that is an open source software to run VS Code on sort of any machine. And you can access it through a client such as browser or your local VS Code instance as well. Now, here are a few of my favorite memes that display why it is very painful to use Emacs, though the Emacs user look pretty cool because they get inbuilt browser as well. But, you know, you can see how many binding keys exist and how many times you have to click in order to get help. So that's not really handy. Now, in order to deal with this thing, we we, need, we wanted to provide a, a reliable cloud native environment to CNCF projects that can, that can be used by those projects to onboard new contributors. And the main problem that is faced by the new contributor is to get started. As, as um, the famous Chinese proverb goes like, uh, a thousand mil journey starts with single step. That single step is often very difficult. And we wanted to you know, is uh, we wanted to reduce the friction to take that single step. So our approach was to uh, initially we use Pair, that is an in-house product, to automate lots of tasks while initially testing our infrastructure that was spent using Coder. In the end, in the end of this whole project as as a whole, it's quite big project. Uh, the only part that I did was to test it in order to spin up the spin up the 
infrastructure locally and automating the task using pair. And we are hoping to see a fully hosted solution to run secured Kubernetes cluster that can be deployed on infrastructure that, that might be provided by CNCF in future. So what it would look like? It can look like whatever you want it to look like. The like uh, first for security purpose, we can have B cluster that is a that is virtual cluster instance. We can even use Kubert that provides uh, operating virtual machines using Kubernetes and Talos is is a uh, instance provided by Equinix. Uh, so it is basically a, a bare metal server. And similarly, we have a cluster API provider for Talos as well. We can directly spin up a Talos um, bare metal to check whether we can set up an infrastructure because the the coder that the tool that we are using is essentially not for uh, only cloud native environments. For example, if Linux Foundation wants to automate some of the Linux project itself, we can use bare metal to set up that Linux for that Linux project particularly, and um, we are good to go. So what it would look like in the end. We hopefully want to look at DNS to be some somewhat like this, uh, where palco.cncf.coder.io, qtl.cncf.coder.io, or maybe kubernetes.cncf.coder.io can be used by the new contributors to just, you know, use this project link and they can, uh, they're good to go. That is what we are aiming for. Uh, so the whole big idea behind this whole thing was to, to make that first step for the potential contributors easier. Because as I said, a journey of thousand meals begin with a single step. It's, this is a famous Chinese proverb. Uh, so uh, let me show you the, this, the loop for the first time. Uh, this wreaks havoc, change, build, deploy. But, and we want to make it like this. This is comparably very easier. You just need to change things and you do not need to take into consideration what is happening underneath because the whole infrastructure would be managed by uh, someone else. And uh, I would like to thank my mentor, Hippie. During mentorship, I was able to learn a lot. So I'm thankful to Hippie. And as this project was not very much code inclined because we were doing lots of testing and infrastructure provisioning and administrative stuff. I realized that coding is the most easiest of all tasks. In fact, the biggest problem is to realize uh, the system architecture, the security walls, how, uh, the area, the surface area of attack, a lot of things uh, such a, uh, that I was not aware of, including developer productivity, so I'm thankful this this mentorship gave me uh, a life uh, an experience that that definitely would be able to uh, bolster up my position and uh, that's all I would like to thank everyone for being a great audience thanks a lot. So hello everyone, um, I, Edwin Joy, along with Priya Shrati, would like to present the mentorship works related to feature optimizations for RISC-V compliance test generator and RISC-V ISA coverage. So a little bit about ourselves. Um, I am Edwin Joy. I'm currently working as a verification engineer at InCore Semiconductors Private Limited. I was, under, I, I was an undergraduate student, uh, final year student uh, during the spring edition of this mentorship. And I'm interested in the arena of computer architecture and embedded control systems. Mm. Hi everyone, I am Priyan Shradi and I'm currently pursuing my bachelor's degree in electronics and communication engineering from the Indian Institute of Technology, Rutki. 
I'm really interested in open source development and have been taking part in many open source programs. I took part in the LFX mentorship program in the fall of 2022 under the risk organization. And I'll be talking more about that experience later in the presentation. Thank you. So let's set up the background of this uh, mentorship. So we worked on a framework called RiskOff. So RiskOff stands for Risk Five Compliance Framework. And it's used to test if a Risk Five implementation uh, fares well against a Risk Five reference model. It's used to test if the implementation follows all the guidelines and all the steps required to, uh, to make a Risk Five process. So it has a uh, dependency on these following tools Risk Five Config, Risk Five Isaac, and CTG, which we will be talking about in the next slide. So as an input to the framework, we have the specification of the DUT, the device under test. We also have the two plugins, which connects to the device under test and the golden reference model. So the specification is passed in RISC-V config. risc config validates uh, that specification and spits out a standard specification. On the other side, we have a test pool, which has all the tests. The framework generates all the tests and uh, generates a test list. And based on the specification, it filters out the important tests which matter uh, for the said um, DOT. We also have a cover group format file, uh, which is a blueprint uh, for all the different cover points which needs to be covered through the entirety of the test. It is passed to RISC-V ISAC, which calculates the coverage through the test. It also has a dual purpose. Uh, it also can be passed to RISC-V CTG to generate a test. So the filtered test list, the tests are run on both the DOT and the plugin. The model uh, gives out an execution trace, which can be used to calculate the coverage. And also uh, both the model and UT are executed and compared. The comparison happens in the signature region of the memory. So the signature region is the region where um, a unique value of each and every test cases are, uh, are stored. So we can uh, check that unique value. The unique value is usually the value stored in the destination register of an instruction. So these two, um, produces its own report, and that report tells us how, how well the uh, implementation adheres to the RISC-V standards. So this entire box uh, constitutes risk -off. So here are our contributions. Uh, here are my contributions um, during the spring, spring uh, edition of the mentorship. So the first task that we had was the design of a disassembler uh, using RISC-V opcode. So it's a, a RISC-V opcode is a repository which enumerates all risk for instruction. So a typical add instruction is uh, encoded as follows. And then um, we de uh, designed a hierarchical disassembler using that as a metadata. So uh, we used a, a way of masking and comparing recursively until we reach a final destination, final instruction. So this is used to keep our code base more future proof because the risk five uh, risk five opcode is uh, continuously updated and maintained. We also had a task of parallelization of the coverage calculation. So coverage calculation is an embarrassingly parallel workload, and it, it was parallelized. And we also had an option to dynamically remove the cover point once they are hit, because um, it makes more sense to take the percentage of coverages rather than just uh, the number of, cover point, number of times the cover point is cover point listed. So we also ma uh, made changes to the CGF to accommodate different pseudo instructions uh, uh, in, uh, in the risk five world. So here are the contributions to risk five CTG. This is the test generator. So the support to the new CGF is added here. And we also had a different type of, a new type of infrastructure added to the framework, which is cross combination test generation. So in this uh, type of test, we cover instruction sequences. So we would like to have uh, an I type instruction followed by three, uh, instructions which we do not care. And then we have a sub instruction uh, pertaining to the condition that the first and the last instruction should have a dependency where uh, the destination registers are same, right? So we'd like to uh, generate a test corresponding to that. And that is, uh, uh, that is the uh, one of the major additions through this mentorship. So a, a test corresponding to that can be seen on the screen. Um, so this type of tests are very important because it helps us, it helps us to pipe, uh, detect, to detect and uh, isolate different kinds of pipelining hazards uh, that can come into DUT. So now I'd like to hand over the control to the presentation to Priyansh Rathi uh, to talk about the fall edition of this mentorship. Thank you.
Okay, so with Priyansh taking over, and now I'll talk about my contributions. Okay. Cool. So I also worked on the same two projects that Edwin worked on, the Risky Compliance Test Generator and the Risky ISA Coverage, Isaac. So talking about my contributions, my contributions on Risky Isaac involve re-architecting the Isaac code base to make it easier to add support for future extensions. So the thing is, RISC-WE allows for extensions for its base ISA to be extended by a number of extensions, and many new extensions keep coming up very frequently. Each time a new extension comes up, we'll need to account for it in our compliance testing framework too. And my project addressed exactly this issue. So we basically made the process of adding support for new extensions intuitive and such that it only requires very minimal changes. We also made sure to take full advantage of the syntactic sugar uh, provided by Python to make the process as simple as possible. Now, moving on, my second contribution was also again on the Isaac component, and this time it was to implement robust tracking of data propagation. Now, first of all, what is data propagation? So you see in an architectural test, in an assembly test, two things need to be achieved. First of all, you need to hit a condition on the architectural state, which we call as cover points. And the second thing is to store the output values as a result of that condition, as a result of your instructions, and store that output value from the affected registers into a designated signature region. And here's a simple assembly test that uh, describes this. So you've got your um, conditions for a uh, hit by this add instruction, and then your store instruction propagates your uh, output, the affected uh, output registers value. Now, I basically, so before my contributions, the uh, coverage uh, evaluation for propagation of this data was done in an ad hoc manner but I implemented a robust register tracking approach to correctly track uh, data propagation and update the required matrix. Okay, so moving on, my third and final contribution was on the risk v compliance test generators, and it was to add basic support for checking compliance with the privilege part of the risk v specification. So the thing is, we had decent CDG support for the unprivileged part of the RISC-V specification, and our current focus is to add some basic support for the privileged part of the RISC-V specification. And so I started out with supporting very simple cover points of this form where you're just checking a field of a machine mode CSR register if it equal to some value. So we started very basic supporting these kinds of cover points and then added complexity incrementally. And now we can support cover points, uh, much convoluted cover points of this form too. So that's it about my contributions to the project. Now I'd like to talk about some of our key takeaways from the mentorship. So first and foremost, we obviously learned risk we assembly programming. We also learned the importance of incremental software development. So when you're developing a complex piece of software from scratch, you cannot add all the complexity from the beginning. You have to start simple and then add the complexity uh, incrementally. We also learned to imbibe a future-proof software design philosophy, uh, which is particularly important in the RISC-V ecosystem as it is constantly evolving. We were also introduced to many fascinating risk fee open source initiatives. And finally, we learned to better follow the open source etiquette. And I'm sure this will help us a lot in our future open source endeavors. So finally, I would like to take this opportunity to thank everyone involved that made our mentorship a very smooth experience. I would like to thank our mentors, Mr. Neil Gala and Mr. S. Pavan Kumar, who took out the time from their busy schedules to help us out. Thank you so much. I would also like to thank the people involved in the non-technical aspects of our mentorship too. 
And finally, I'd like to thank the Linux Foundation and the Risky Organization for providing us with such a wonderful learning opportunity. So with that, I'd like to conclude our presentation. Thank you all for your patience. You've been a wonderful audience. You're coming in a it's bit coming. soft, Piyush. You can uh, increase your volume. Yeah, I'm, uh, am I audible now? Yeah, it's good now. Thank you. So, uh, first of all, I would like to introduce myself. We cannot hear you, we just hear noise. Let's go on. Um, Hello. Yush, we can see your screen now. Uh, so, am I audible, ma'am? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, so, starting my uh, slides, I would like to show. Uh, first of all, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Piyush Mishra, and I'm from Hotel Khan University, Jhansi, Uttar Pradesh. Currently pursuing my Bachelor's of Technology in Computer Science and Engineering, and I'm in my final year. Uh, I started a Linux Foundation mentorship program in September, and uh, I, I have gone through. Uh, I've gone through first. Uh, first, how it started is uh, I started using Linux environment, and uh, then the curiosity just grew out to me, and uh, I started developing scripts and uh, developing uh, what I what I can develop from. searching web i suddenly came uh, uh, with the fact that uh, we can actually uh, be enrolled in uh, linux foundation mentorship program and uh, i just uh, submitted the application and i got enrolled in it so starting ahead uh, my project was linux kernel bug fixing project a uh, fall and fail so uh, journey of my open source development and debugging so major topics that we are going to be discussing in these slides will be virtualization, syscaller and sysbot, sending patches and kernel mailing list. So kernel, according to me, uh, kernel is something that really works uh, beneath the layers and uh, works for your machine for delivering the messages from your hardware to your software and the perfect messenger for a machine would not be anything else than kernel. So as I stated here, uh so what are bugs basically what are bugs so bugs our life uh, evolves and revolves around bugs and fixing them uh, is something that is called life so this should be stated before i start my slides one of my major motivation working behind the linux kernel was to start working with the architecture level i i have experience uh, First, I have experienced Android development, and then I 
started to work upon the open source development and then i think uh, then i thought that uh, working on the architectural levels of android uh, could be very beneficial for me so i started learning uh, so this mentorship program was not a uh, job for me it's more than uh, that it's something uh, worth to be learning but to be considered as learning the core components that enable so i would like to come to my next slide starting with the open source as i stated websites like linux from scratch.org so this was the first site i came in reference to with uh, where you can actually go and uh, just learn how the linux kernel development environment works. I just started studying the material there. I watched videos, I searched, I Google searched everything. And I was able to build something uh, which could be considered as a build environment, which is still under progress. So major challenges or bugs, uh, understanding the task that what has to be done. Okay, so the first thing that was uh, challenging uh, that was challenging in this program was assigned task to me as uh, honestly i don't have any uh, bug fixing experience before this program i was not having any bug fixing uh, experience so just studying the material over there and uh, getting what uh, what what has to be performed was the first challenge that i faced starting with the mainline source as i remembered my first task was to uh, build and compile the Linux kernel from source and uh, run it over a build environment. Virtualization actually works there. So uh, the, the tools that I used were KMU, uh, GDB, and build environment for making build environment GDB. And for virtualization, I used KMU. So understanding the kernel.org logs. Uh, major tasks of uh, any bug fixing regarding linux um, development and linux debugging environment is to start and understanding the bugs that are stated by developers all over the world building the key foundation resources for debugging the kernel so as it all goes with google search and it all goes with uh, the mentorship under which mentor you are getting and uh, luckily i was having a wonderful uh, pair of peers and uh, my mentors that helped me uh, through contents that what i can get from tools so tools are camu virtualbox and gdb virtualization virtualization is actually something that uh, prevents uh, you from destroying your machine as when you are working with the scripts, as when you are working with the scripts and you um, you are just testing scripts that uh, which could be used, as in my case, I have to test each and every script that I could Google search. So virtualization really saved my machine that time. Techniques, booting the compile kernel with KMU uh, using GDB and build root. So actually the my first task was to build uh, the kernel from source and i have compiled it using kmu which took me around uh, five to six days actually uh, as i have to get first I, as i have to understand what the task is asking asking me to do and then i have to search everything how to perform that so yeah procedures fuzzing and stack trace Fuzzing was the best uh, thing that I got to know about uh, as uh, I don't have any experience before that. And one of my tasks was to search and write everything about you can get about fuzzing. So fuzzing goes like that, that you are having a uh, program. <laughs> And uh, you have to test for it uh, that uh, what bugs is this program is having. So giving a pair of inputs until the program breaks is something fuzzy. Stack trace. Every PID, every process that is going uh, upon your kernel could be uh, stack trace. And decode dot uh, decode stack trace dot was uh, the 
script that was used at that time. This color in this dot. I really took a lot of time understanding this dot. This dot is the this dot that both that we have debuggers to find, which active ones are currently going in the kernel, and uh, the dashboard act, uh, actively tells you about the vulnerability uh, degree of the bugs. So this color tools so as you have to first compile the kernel. First compile the kernel, then boot over to you, and then uh, you can. Attach it to the scholar and find the bugs in your kernel. In all the procedures, the most effective tool. This this actually virtualization really helps you. Currently, I I am going through uh, Windows operating system and I could use uh, as uh, so virtualization was really helpful at that time. As on my Linux, I was. For testing the build environment, sending patches. So patches. Uh, I have generated a couple of patches. Uh, I would like to say uh, that uh, I basically got the check patch uh, dot pl script, which uh, tells you about uh, the leftover work of the developers that they could be corrected by other developers, and I work on the driver staging Android. So this was the uh, basic folder that I worked upon and sent it the patch to my man. So check patch dot pl script is really helpful uh, as it can give you a lot of insight about whatever the uh, leftover work built by the developers who are developing the kernel. That's a lot of work to be done. In the meantime, as uh, September, I think September, uh, I came to the knowledge of a security bug reported by them. Uh, actually, this is not resolved by me, but uh, it was a good resource uh, to learn about. Uh, open switch fix for OB access in Reserves, which was fixed by rearranging the flow access. Files. So that was quite. Where I learned from was a different uh, method. So declarations were changed in this bug. Sending patches uh, is the best part about developers. The, uh, the developers all over the world share their um, work by sending emails, and emails are uh, uh, used. To make this. And uh, patches are the messenger of developers. While we are working, so every work that is done by you can share other developers over the world by sending patches. And uh, check patch dot pl script works with that too, but you have to work with Git also. Kernel mailing list. It's actually important when you are working with a kernel uh, debugging program. Kernel mailing list enrolls every bug. On those, on those bugs, it can it can decide you to uh, where bugs are placed. It can uh, actually holds the source. Salutations and regards to everyone uh, who are uh, with uh, this mentorship program. And I came in uh, came in contact with the other bugs that could be dealing with. Actually, that was an Eva's topic uh, effect uh, in Android. I come from an Android background, so uh, Android API responsible for audio. At that point, learn more about how the system works. These four vulnerabilities were actually uh, were actually resolved by uh, October patch, 2021, and December 20. But later I came in contact, or uh, later I seen that uh, the bugs could be still active. 
upon my google search i would like to go this like form i think on my site that the these bugs could be resolved in android version 12 and android version 13 as i see it upon my uh, expertise that i could gather from google search so uh, yeah android 12 and android 13 Exactly, resolve these issues. Uh, if you find these issues, uh, or if also uh, that, then Android will be working to fix it. You can find on the library that it can be resolved. Apart from my mentorship program, I face these bugs too. And find the proper solutions that will be so updating and updating your systems are the best learning. Salutations and very very much. All the learning I did for work uh, on work on such basic things. What could be brought up on how to work on this. So basically, I would like to thank my mentors and uh, my peers that were so kind. and uh, the community driven method used by linux foundation and open source community uh, driven method methodology really help in this program uh, have a team of servers to record this uh, i know it is slack but they are sort done this got this we just to talk about uh, what could be done uh, so learning uh, Cooperation really help. Uh, from my side, this project was a totally learning. I faced uh, serious bugs. I faced my life bugs too. So I uh, move forward in resolution and still facing bugs uh, in life in my journey. But uh, yeah, we can solve them. And uh, upon what information I can carry forward from this. Project. Please keep updating and updating the uh, as required. Well, and that's my appointment for everyone. And uh, these bugs were resolved. But if you find them, then thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hello everyone. Oh, I'm audible, right? Can I start? Yes, please. Go ahead. Thank you. So, hey everyone. I'm Dev Mitran. I'm a junior blockchain engineer at Check. Uh, my project was to create a CLI tool called DRMAN in order to provision and administer DID registries. Uh, I'll start with decentralized identifier. They are permanent. they should be permanent they should be resolvable they should be cryptographically verifiable and it should be decentralized uh every did uh, looks like this they have a did method which specifies their uh how cred operations how should they be created resolved updated and deactivated generally a did it resolves for did document and this document contains uh, multiple public keys and service endpoints of a did subject so this subject can be anyone in the real world and the did and did documents are hosted in a verifiable data registry so this can be a blockchain it can be a database as long as uh, the ecosystem trusts that registry it's fine so our motivation was there are a lot of did methods being proposed and most of them are based on blockchain such as indi uh, it's based on a public permission blockchain checked which is based on cosmos blockchain they have their advantages but we wanted to create a very lightweight did registry which even which doesn't consume as much resources as a blockchain but 
uh, still has most of the properties of a blockchain. So we chose uh, Git because it's distributed, it, it, it has data integrity, it's widely used, and it mainly it has a membership management layer. There are multiple providers such as GitHub and GitLab. There are some disadvantages such as uh, there is a steep learning curve. You can't manage a complete Git uh, DID registry just using the GitHub commands. Uh, so that's why we created a CLI tool, which is very easier and creates a standardized protocol. And uh, the main disadvantage is here is that the providers are centralized. The GitHub and GitLab, they are going to be centralized. So we made sure in our design that the data in the DID registry, they are going to be independent of the DID provi uh, the provider. So our CLI tool is created in a modular structure. It has uh, three plugins so far. It has a DID plugin, which creates uh, updates and resolves and deactivates the DID. And there is also a registry plugin, which creates a repository with certain rules, uh, so, which matches our DID registry. And also an organization can add more rules on however they want. There is also a wallet plugin, which, which can be used to create and store keys. This wallet plugin can be swapped with any other external wallet if they want. Our registry architecture, uh, first they should select a provider, which can be GitHub or GitLab or any other providers. Uh, the management layer is going to be dependent on the provider. Generally, all the providers, uh, they have organizations, they have different teams, which we can create, and different rules for uh, reviewing a pull request and workflows, et cetera, right? So the management layer, and there's a data layer, which is going to store the DID documents and uh, different resources, which can be binded to a DID document, such as even an image or, uh, a credential can be published in this DID registry. So the, we have created in a way that this uh, data layer is going to be ind independent of the provider because uh, this is a DID registry. Now there are different identifiers here. And if I, the document of the identifier is going to be the DID document, but nowhere have we include a GitHub username or GitHub organization name, et cetera. So, the data is going to be completely independent of the provider. And for every identifier, a folder can be created where they can publish as many resources which they want. So uh, there can be multiple DID registries and they can create a sharing environment and they can exchange data as long as they trust the other organization. So our DID method is going to look like DID get followed by the provider, either GitHub or GitLab, and then the organization name, the registry name, and the identifier itself. And if they want to resolve a specific content of that identifier, and that can be done too. Uh, so I'm going to create, uh, we are going to show a quick demo. We created using DRMAN and Aries framework JavaScript. So this demo, so DID registry is an organization here. I'm going to create a new uh, registry called Hyperledger here. So I'm going to use the DRMAN CLI tool and I'm going to quickly so yeah so this creates a registry with uh, different teams it creates uh, mandatory teams and then specific rules which are needed in a pull request in order to review it and then once the repository is created uh, so, I'm, so we can see hyperledger repository here so this is going to act as a DID registry. Currently, there is no DIDs being published here. I'm going to publish a DID using Aries Framework JavaScript. Yeah, so first I'm going to publish a DID. Let's check the repository now. So what is going to happen is it's not going to directly add it here. Instead, it's going to raise a pull request, which can be reviewed by analyzing different rules, which the organization decides. So depending on the commit name, we can trigger a workflow and run a few tests. And only if a, a minimum set of people review it, then it can be merged. Along with the DID, I can publish a few resources which need to be part of that DID. 
So I have published two other resources. You can see three comments here. Along with the DID, I have published a schema and also another. Uh, this is needed for a verifiable credential, basically, these three resources. So once, once it's merged and we can see the repository, it has the ident identifier DID document and also creates a folder for it. Within that, it has multiple resources of the DID. Right. So I'm going to use the DRMN CLI tool now in order to resolve whatever we, we have published so far. So I'm choosing the DID get method. I'm going to resolve it. And I'm going to enter the structure which I've mentioned in, the, in my previous slide. It's going to be GitHub and the organization name and the uh, uh, registry name, which is Hyperledger and the identifier. So it returns me a DID document and it contains a signature. It can have the public key, which I can use in order to go and connect with that DID subject. So if this is to re resolve a DID, now if I want to resolve the content, a specific content within that, I can show a demo of that too. So I published a schema which had three, which is going to, which has three attributes. Uh, and this, I can use this to in order to issue a verifiable credential. So yeah, uh, we created the CLI tool completely using Bash script so that it's very lightweight and it can be used in uh, even an IoT device such as, now let's take a smartphone and then uh, those devices can create a GitHub re repository and then they can use that in order to manage the identities between them. So the project itself can be thought of application specific DID registries. There can be one organization and they can uh, create multiple registries for different applications, right? So uh, as, as I conclude, the main advantage I've got through open source is the connections I got through this project, the mentors, they were very helpful. So more than the project and what I learned here, I, the connections were a very big uh, deal for me. And this uh, introduction of me to decentralized identity field and that uh, opened me a lot of job opportunities. So uh, very thanks for that. You can check the repository here and any questions are welcome. Thanks. Hi, hello. Hi, hello. Um, just do a bit of introduction. My name is Umebewe. Great. Um, I'm from Nigeria, Nigerian, and I attend the University of Portakot on Sukkar. Um, I worked on the Fablo project, and uh, my mentors were Jacob and Petre. So um, my project was to enable uh, Kubernetes operator for Fablo. Um, Fablo is a simple tool to generate the hyperallergic fabric network from a config and run it on Docker. So one of the main goals of Fablo is like to provide an easy way to get started with hyperledger fabric. So um, it uses a declarative approach to define components in the network, components like the channels, the pairs, um, the CAs and the organizations. So that file is called um, the Fablo config. And when, before I came in, only Docker was supported. Why I came in to this, what I did at this was to um, build the Kubernetes engine to add support for the Kubernetes engine. So the technologies used in this project was Bash, TypeScript, um, a bit of Kubernetes, um, Kubernetes and Docker. So yeah, um, this is what a Fablo config.json or even YAML file looks like. So um, the orgs are defined here. Uh, you can put in the org name, the domain, um, number of peer instances, which DB to use, if it's on level DB or Postgres, the orders, and the rest of them, also the tools. So from this config, Hyperledger, um, uh, Fablo takes this config and provisions your uh, network. So the um, project, the objectives of this was to uh, for Fablo to support uh, current features. 
4K is like um, bringing up a um, network, taking it down, pruning it, as deleting the target uh, network, um, installing chain codes, and also upgrading chain code. And um, also, Fablo is able to generate YAMUs for K8 um, de deployment. So, um, for the second objective, it did not really come off as we wanted because at the end of the day, we, end up, we ended up using an operator to deploy um, these network into K8. So, there was no actually need of YAMUs. So project de uh, deliverables. So the first deliverable was to set up a simple network using the HLF operator. So HLF operator is um, a Kubernetes operator that provisions different uh, components of Hyperledger fabric. So those are the CAs, the orders, pairs, channels, and chain codes. So what I did at first was to like write the target scripts to like set up this using the HLF operator. So um, the second deliverable was um, to template the created script. So Fablo has an engine which um, takes your Fablo, the, which takes um, the values defined in the Fablo config and passes them to the template, which generates the values in the script. So this is kind of a whole um, backend work. So um, also, the other was to write snapshot tests for the templates and also write E to E tests to make sure that um, what we have built are, um, are working properly. So, for deliverable was to verify or Fablo commands are properly so, uh, supported, generate, which was to like generate a Fablo config, um, also to start, stop, up, down, and, and the whole chain code operations. So um, project executions and accomplishment. So I was able to complete the requirement for setting up a network on K8 using Fablue. And I was also able to complete the templating and test cases. Um, before this, I did not have any experience with Hyperledger Fabric. I only knew that um, it's kind of a private blockchain. So these projects helped me to explore the whole ecosystem of Hyperledger Fabric. Um, at first, I faced initial problems with installing the chain code using HLF operator because um, this was kind of a bug on HLF operator. So um, these problems I faced helped me to like explore the internals of um, HLF operator, understand what is going on there and fixing things and interacting with the community over there with the HLF operator. So um, before this, I haven't also run like setting up, I, I, I didn't have what it takes, like have no, more, enough knowledge to install, uh, like set up Kubernetes clusters in a CI environment. So um, this also helps me to like understand how Kubernetes clustered are uh, set up in the CI environment and uh, how tests are run there. So um, recommendations for future work. Um, a lot of the features and what we are doing are defined in this GitHub issue here, but I'll just go over like some of them that are really kind of priority. So um, one of the one of the recommendation for future work i'll also be i'll also continue working on fablo because um yeah i think i'll be here for a long time yeah hopefully becoming a maintainer also so one of the recommendations for future work one of the future work we are looking at right now is like implementing an um test order sharding so to improve scalability and performance also we'll, uh, we'll kind of exploring the option of using snapshot and um restore commands for disaster recovery. Um, okay, we are also evaluating the use of private data collections for sharing sensitive information. So um, features like TLS and Fablo REST, um, Blockchain Explorer and Fabric in lower versions than 2.0 are not currently being supported. So um, we are also, also kind of evaluating that also. Um, we're also looking into adding um, dev mode for testing and development purposes. So um, 
this has been a really um valuable experience i was able to challenge and improve my skills so much um i learned a lot about collaboration i also learned a lot about um hyperledger fabric and also how templates in work. so for the foreseeable future i'll continue working on pablo and other open source projects so um i'll say a very big thank you to my mentors and um jacob and Peter. and i'll also say a very big thank you to hyperledger and linux foundation for giving me this opportunity to work on fablo thank you very much Thank you, everybody. Um, thanks, everybody, for uh, speaking, sharing your experiences. It's um, awesome to hear um, all of you share what you have learned uh, in the mentorship uh, on your mentorship projects. And this is the reason why we do what we do. And I thank all the mentors. Uh, without them, we won't be able to do what we do and our sponsors as well. Thank you so much.